All right. It's recording should be in progress. There we go. So tonight we're picking up from chapter four in Sefer Shoftim. This is uh, what we read last week during the Haftorah, and we're going to get right into the story. And we're actually starting at verse number four. What happened until now was after the death of, uh, or even before the death of the of the previous Shofet, uh, Shamgar, the the enemy, the Knani, as the beginning of the chapter describes, the Yavin, the king of Knan, formed an alliance with other enemies of the Jews, and he started attacking the Jewish people and oppressing them. Uh, as we'll see later, the situation was quite dire. The Jews didn't feel comfortable traveling at all. They moved from open cities into walled cities. They were really suffering on a regular and constant basis. This was a very fierce enemy. And what's important to note here is previously they, uh, I'm sorry, one moment. Put your mirror. Don't 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 we'll, we'll worry about that later. Good to hear, Wendy. Previously, um, can you hear me all right? I just want to make sure about that. Yes, it's good. Good. Okay. The enemies that attacked before were from the other side of the Yarde, Moab. Uh, now we have actually within the land of Canaan, which means Hashem is getting a little bit more serious. Like uh, is famously taught about the affliction of Taras. First it starts on your home and then your clothing and then your house. Hashem always tries to come gradually to wake up a person. But if the Jews don't get the message, it's going to become more and more severe and closer to home. So here it was in their home in the north of Israel. The king of what was formerly Chatzor started a new stronghold called Haroshet Goim, Goim, the, the gathering place of, not, of, the, of the nations. And many men were on his side, and he had 900 iron chariots, 900 iron, iron chariots. To give you an idea, in the past parts that we just read, Paro came with how many chariots, do you recall? 600. Very good. 600 uh, chariots. And that was quite a threat to 600,000 uh, military men. And here we have what we're going to find is 10,000 military men. And he had one and a half times uh, greater than that. He had 900 chariots with him. So now the camera shifts and we go to the leader of the Jewish people at the time. This is verse 4 where we're picking up. Udvora Isha Nevia. Devora was a prophetess. She was a Navia. Ashes Lapidos. She was, this, is, this term is going to have to be explained. It could be translated as a fiery lady or the wife of fire. <laughs> we'll explain that. He shoftad Yisrael She judged the Jewish people at that time. And she would sit under the palm of Devor, palm, the palm tree of Devor, that's what they called it, between the cities of Ramah and Beit El, uh, near Har Ephraim. And the Jews would go up to her, La Mishpat. The Jews would go up to, their, to her to serve as the judge. She would serve as the judge and tell them decisions. Okay, so let, first let's meet our hero. Her name is Devora. How, how were the judges selected, appointed? Oh. Good. This is an, an important question. So let, let's start with that point. It says, He Shoftai Israel. The, the Rishonim in Masechet Sanhedrin and Ivamos and other places, they discuss whether a woman is an eligible judge to sit on the Sanhedrin. A judge is always chosen by his abilities, his, his stature, the level of his, of his wisdom, his knowledge, and, uh, right, and, and uh, ability to adjudicate properly. Uh, there's a question if a woman serve, can actually serve as a judge. From here, it would seem that yes, she can, because it says clearly that she was judging the Jewish people. However, there's, an, there's a different opinion in Rishonim that a woman is not able to be a judge. So what, in fact, is happening here with Devorah? They give one of two answers. She was the wisest one of the generation. She had the most Torah knowledge. Although she could not technically sit as a judge, she would provide all the information and her opinion and guide the other judges, the sages, as to how to, how to uh, uh, adjudicate and judge the, the cases. So she would be sitting there as an uh, advisor, basically, and she was not doing the technical issuing of judgment, but they would want to hear her opinion, and, and she was basically running the show. That's one opinion, that she was not a 
technical judge, but that she was practically carrying out judgments. Uh, the other opinion is, since she was the most qualified person in that generation, there is an exception to the rule. If the most qualified person in the generation is unfit technically to be a judge, he will become the judge regardless. So that's how we have also um, Shmaya and Avtalion, um, there were two converts, and they were the head of the generation, the head of the Sanhedrin, and is usually not allowed to be a convert. And just, it's an interesting halacha learned out from from uh, technical details. Um, however, in that case, since he was the most qualified, he was the, the leader. So, so to hear, since she was the most qualified, he, she was the leader, which shows you who we're dealing with. It also reflects poorly on the generation. It shows you how great she is, but also... She doesn't have a mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Women are not obliged in Talmud Torah, obligated in Talmud Torah. And nevertheless, she surpassed everybody else, which shows that in general, the level of the scholarship in that time and the level of the righteousness was not up to par with what it was previously. Okay? So it, she was fantastic, but that also reflects poorly on her generation because nobody was able to, to achieve what she had, even with the obligation to learn Torah day and night, which she did not have. And it says that she was Ashes Lapidot. A woman of fire, a fiery lady. So what does that refer to? Uh, there are a few interpretations. One is, Eshet Lapidot, she was the one who prepared the wicks for the temple, or the uh, the Mishkan at the time. You, you would have to have candles uh, by, by learning and candles to light the way around the Mishkan tabernacle area, and she prepared the wicks to enable that to happen. <laughs> Which seems to be like, uh, if you're putting things on your resume, you know, you talk about uh, what you know, what you've learned, <laughs> who you know. I prepare wicks also, by the way, I volunteer. I, 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 I give some uh, tea lights to the shul on a monthly basis. So why is that a significant thing? The fact that you prepared wicks for for the baby drash and for the service. Uh, that's interesting. I, I guess maybe I'll put that out as a question to you. If, you know, of the top things you're going to list, it doesn't tell us her whole life story. The name that she gets, her, her nickname is the one who prepares the wicks. The wick lady. Why is that so significant? Why do you think that's important? Any thoughts on that? There's no right or wrong answer. Right? I'd like to hear what you think, if you have any ideas. Say, that's one way they had of identifying her. I think that even uh, surnames sometimes identify a person's uh, profession. Uh, profession or occupation or where they live. Uh, okay, so you, you, you're kind of, you start your challenging the premise of the question. I was suggesting that this, this suggests that this is something very significant, mm -hmm. uh, which maybe you should put on your resume. You're saying this is just a way to identify. It's an identifying feature. This is what she did. You know, could have called her doctor, but she wasn't a doctor. It called her the wick repair. Very good. Okay. A fair yeah. answer. But she everyone brought... knows she made wicks. Or she did. Was she, what uh, tribe did she belong to, do you think? It was Ephraim? Ephraim? Uh, I believe so. Farak was from? Naftali, right? Naftali, excuse me. That's right. rock, but she was she was judging in uh, the area of Ephraim. Yes, yeah, she was judging in Har Ephraim. Uh, I don't know what tribe she's. That's a good question. Does she anybody else have a comment? Yeah. yeah, she also brought light to the people, so they could read, so they could study, so they could pray. Very good, excellent. She is the one who enabled them to do all, all of the spiritual growth that you'd be doing in the area of the tabernacle. That learning after dark or before light and the praying that will be occurring. She enabled all of that. And she had many good things to do at the time. She was the greatest scholar of the generation. You understand? And she was taking the time to, to sit there, you know, rolling the wigs together. You see the tremendous value that she had for wisdom and for spiritual growth that not only that she take care of her own learning and her own knowledge. She wanted to make sure that everybody else had that available to them as well. That's a, a, a beautiful point. Uh, a second interpretation to Asia Lapidot is not, so the first is she prepares the wicks. Uh, the second interpretation of Asia Lapidot is the wife of a Lapidot. A Lapid is a flame or a fire. This opinion says that her husband was Barak. Barak, we'll see, is the one who led the Jews to war in this, in this case. And some say that she was her, his wife. Barak means lightning, and fire and lightning are closely related. So they refer to her as the fire, uh, fire wife. She's the wife of Barak. That's what it means. 
Uh, it is interesting to say that they were married, because as we'll see, it seems that they were not living together. She has to summon Barak and instruct him to go to war, as we'll see in a couple of verses. So if she was his wife, what is she doing summoning him? Maybe she had to be in Har Ephraim to judge people, and you know she had to leave her home. Or uh, one interpretation actually says, I, I don't recall who, maybe it was the Radak, that she, just like Moshe, left Tzipora to be in a constant state of readiness because he was a prophet. She left Barak to be in a constant state of ready, readiness to communicate with Hashem because she was a, a, a prophetess. I thought that was a very interesting interpretation, especially because, as, Mo, uh, as Aaron and Miriam said, hey, we're also prophets. We don't have to leave our spouses. So we thought that it was just Moshe that had this unique thing that he had to even leave his wife to, to, to be at a constant state of readiness to speak to God. And here we're seeing that Devorah did the same thing. So that, it's just an interesting thing. I, I, I was wondering why that should be so. Maybe if you're the leader of the generation, yet you have to have constant access to God. You know, if a question comes in in the middle of the day, you have to, you have to be ready <laughs> to go reach out to God. So the second interpretation is she is the wife of Barak. And then we also discussed uh, why would it be that she's living in a different place? Uh, the third interpretation is it's describing an inner quality. Yeah, sorry, somebody want to say something? You just brought up before what Shevet she was from. Yeah. The Medrash says, based on the Pasuk in Yaakov's Bracha and Vayichi, that she was from Naphtali. Uh -huh. And she married Barak from Naphtali. That would make sense. No, Barak was from Ephraim, wasn't he? Oh, no, Barak is from Naphtali. That's right. Barak yeah. is from Naphtali. Yes. Okay. I wonder, do you know what verse they're coming from in the Barak of Yaakov? Thank you for sharing that, first of all. Do you know Naphtali where they're coming from? Naphtali Ayala Shlucha Hanotein Imre Shefer. Ah, uh, oh, so says Hanotein Imre Shefer is a reference to Devorah. Very nice. Very nice. Beautiful. Thank you very much. For some reason, Excellent. the so-called Bible scholars say that she was from Ephraim, but I have no clue what reference they bring to actually support that. It could be because she's sitting here in Har Ephraim. It's interesting, why is she there? Right. Uh, since maybe that's her hometown, but it seems to be more significant than that. If we're saying her husband was from Sully, and she's here especially, there's something to it. Okay. If I he was her husband, if he, if he really was her husband. Right. Exactly, right. As I said, it's only one interpretation. In, 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 right. the, it's, it's, one it's, it's, it's one opinion. In, but it's an opinion of Chazal, right? This is uh, which we have to take seriously. The third interpretation of Eishet Lapidot, the fiery lady, is it's, it's describing an inner quality. We say it even in the common language, right? We, we refer to a person who has an inner fire. Or a, a very spiritual person will call. He will say he's uh, he's on fire. Like a fire is 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 the least physical thing we have. It's like hardly it's it's hardly tangible. And and she was just always bustling, and she was very zariz. And the alacrity that she had resembled that of a fire, a right? constant, constant renewal. Uh, so she was a lady of constant renewal, of tremendous energy and zeal, just like a, like a fire represents. And that's why they called her Eishet Lapidot, the fire lady. This lady was on fire. Again, she was the leader of the generation. In fact, very significantly, this is something uh, we ought to note here, the, the Rishonim, like the Rambam, for example, they listed the chain of tradition from Mount Sinai down till the time of the Talmud. And they listed a chain from Moshe to Yeshua and, and down and down. Um, each rabbi passing the tradition on to the next. What they're describing there is, before the oral Torah was written down and contained into books of the Talmud, it, there, there was the job of one person in each generation to be the to be the transmitter of the tradition. This person, Moshe in his generation, Joshua in his generation, each in his generation has to be in charge of making sure that the oral Torah is transferred intact to the next generation. And you do whatever it takes. Certainly you'll be a teacher, but you also make sure that there's teachers spread out through Israel to make sure that they convey the right Torah and transmit all of, all of the oral Torah. And each generation has one person who's in charge of it. So the Rambam writes the link. He does not write Devorah's name in the link. She was not one of the links of the chain. However, one of the Gaonim, Rav Shri Ra Gaon, he, he also has his own chain. 
and he inserts Devora into the chain. Because of our chapter here, which describes her stature, and it says that she's a judge, which implies she was the greatest in the generation, he says that she was actually a link in the chain. So you're talking about here the lady who was in charge of making sure that the oral Torah stays intact and transfers to the next generation. The, tr the tremendous stature of this lady. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's who you call the fire lady. You take, you think of the personality and the person it takes to, to be in charge of such a thing. Okay, so that's Eshet Lapidot. We said there's three interpretations of what it means as fire lady. Either she prepared wicks to enable fires in the tabernacle and the, in the study halls. She was the wife of Barak, whose name resembles fire, lightning, um, or a flash of lightning, yeah. And, or thirdly, it's her inner essence of fire, which, uh, which, resem which represents zeal and alacrity to do the will of Hashem and to develop. Okay. And she was judging Israel. We said three opinions. How could that be? If she is, if she's a lady, could she be a judge? One answer is yes, a lady can be a judge. The second answer is technically not, but since she's the greatest, it's an exception. And the third answer is she was not the official judge, but she was the one that was guiding all the judges. Okay. Um, so now in verse number six, Barak ben Avinoam. She goes and she calls Barak the son of Avinoam, Mikedesh Naftali, and she says to him. Didn't God say that you should go fight and get rid of the enemy, enemies? Take 10,000 soldiers with you from the Phtali and Zebulun and go. And, and, in, and the verse 7 continues. Umashachti elecha el nachal kishon et sisra tzart I will draw towards you the army general Sisera. It's an interesting expression. Yavin was the name of the king that was fighting against him. His army general was called Sisera. In verse number it says, seven, it said, I will draw toward you. This is an interesting expression. It sounds like it's almost against his will, that he's being drawn into battle against the Jews. So Rashi says that we have from tradition that he consulted his astrologers, Sisera, the army general of the Canaanites, the tremendous army general, as we'll see. He consulted his astrologers, as people did at the time, and they said, don't do it, Sisera. <laughs> You're not going to win. It's bad news. Ladies are bad news. Don't, don't get involved in this war. This, this one's not for you. Leave the Jews alone. And against the advice of the astrologers, he had some calculation or some, an idea, or he was inspired to go into battle. That strange idea that popped into his head and convinced him to go, that's God's work. God is saying, I'm going to draw Sisera into battle. And you imagine the, the, the discussions in the, in the war room, right? The astrologers say it's not a good idea, and politically this is not a good move for us, eh? and there's a whole back and forth. And somebody comes up and makes a good point and, and convinces Sisera to go into battle. That is just an agent of God. So whatever natural conversations and phenomena had to take place to convince him, God is attesting here that he's the one who's drawing Sisera into battle, even though rationally it shouldn't have been done and he does it but Barak's response is Barak who is just called to be the army or the leader of the Jewish, Jewish army he says if you go with me I'll go but if not I'm not going it's interesting you're not really allowed to deny the command of a prophet so there's some, dis there's some discussion here how is he even able to deny her request for him to go to war maybe it was a request not a command it's there's a back and forth about that. We won't go there. But he says to her, I don't feel that I'm able to do this on my own. I want you to come with us. Now, what's Devorah going to do? She's a woman of the books. She, the women didn't fight in the army then. Just her presence, he felt, would be a spiritual uplift and raise the merits of the Jewish people and enable them to win. He said, us on our own, I feel we don't have the merits to win. Please come with me. And then I'll agree to go because your merits will enable us to be successful. We're learning from here an interesting thing. Just the proximity of a righteous person and the presence of a righteous person uplifts his surroundings. How do we understand such a thing? It could be something metaphysical. Just, you know, the, if, if a tzaddik is close, then the righteous person just uplifts everything around him and we don't really know what's going on. I suspect there's also a rational explanation for this. That people see Devorah, they see a woman who is so righteous, 
and a woman of fire, right, who's, who's, who's just serving Hashem like a blazing fire. And that causes a person to, to lift himself up also. Right? When we're around great people, when we are around great people, we act greater. So he's saying, you come with us and please uplift the morals and therefore the morale of the army. I think, right, so there's probably something metaphysical as well, that the presence of a righteous person helps. But I think also there's, there's a very rational explanation for this. The success of the Jewish people depends on how righteous they are, and they will be inspired to be more righteous and to do teshuva if Devora is there. They'll see her and they'll say, well, hey, we better shape up. So she agrees, but she tells him in verse number nine, I will go with you, Ephes, however, but you're not going to get the glory. Now that you're asking me to come, I, I must tell you, you're not going to get the glory. Because uh, Hashem will give the hand, uh, Sisera, to the hands of a woman. So you, Barak, you will be the general, but you're not going to get the glory. So the Malbim explains here, there's two ways that an army general gets glory. The first is by going into battle and leading his people into battle. And the second is by having some big defeat, a big uh, victory over your enemy. Either he's, he, like, he initiated the march into battle, this brave general. Alternatively, even if he didn't initiate the, the march into battle, he was in charge of a great victory. In this case, the warrior was telling him, now you're going to have neither. Because it's no longer you leading the people into war. It's me. I'm, I'm going with you. So I'm the leader now. And as far as the victory you will have over Sisera, that's not going to be yours either. And here she's foreshadowing to the event that we're going to read soon that is actually going to be a different woman, Yael, a different lady who's going to actually be the one who kills Sisera. Hmm. She's saying, you're not going to get the glory. Uh, women are going to get it. And she's referring to herself and Yael, the, the Devorah for leading the people into battle and Yael for actually killing Sisera. And so indeed they go to, to, uh, to war. And Barak, uh, Yazek, he mustered the Zavulun and Naphtali. He gathers two of the tribes, and that's significant. These are the only two tribes that were involved in the war, Zavulun and Naphtali. All the others were not involved, and we'll hear about that in Devorah's song. Vayal Beraglav, and he goes up by foot. Verse 10 is setting up for us how awful <laughs> the odds are for the Jews. They did not have chariots. They were going by foot against 900 iron chariots, which is like the state-of-the-art military that the, that the Canaanites had. They were going by foot, and they only had two tribes. It wasn't even the full power of the Jewish people. They really had, had awful chances in this war. Vatali mo Devorah goes up with them. The only weapon they had, their secret weapon, was a spiritual one who would not do any fighting. Her name was Devorah. Things like a bee, I guess uh, <laughs> they would say. Hever, and now we have like a little uh, interje in, interjection here. By the way, you should know, Hever Akini, in verse number 10, in the English translation in the art school, they actually put it in parentheses because this is just set, setting up for a future event. Uh, Hever the Kenite had become separated from the Kenites, from the children of Chovav, the father in law of Moses, this is Parsha, and pitched his tents as far as the plains of Ta'ananim, which is near Kadesh. So it's giving us a parenthetical point that there is this fellow, Hever Akeni, from the descendants of Yisro, who was living in that area at the time, up north, as far north as Sa'anan. We learned last, in the past, that the descendants of Yisro actually were stationed near Jericho in Irat Marim, or even south with the tribes of Yehuda. For some reason, this particular family, Hever Akeni, for some reason, you know, life, life happens. They ended up separating from all of their family and moving northwards to where the action is now happening. That's very significant. Uh, you, if you interviewed them, you know, like, hey, Haver, why did you decide to move north and uh, leave your family behind? You know, everyone's going south and you're suddenly going north. What do you have to say, Haver? He would give you some, probably like some boring answer. Oh, I, I, you know, I got a new job in high tech and I thought there was a good opportunity over there. He'd give you some, some, some answer, which was a very normal one and had to do with natural causes. As we'll see, this parenthetical point, that this individual decided to move and separate from his family, 
this ends up setting up the victory for the Jewish people. The Kenites, who he was from, he was a convert, they were converts, but they had a bris, a covenant with the Canaanites, and therefore when Sisera, who was fleeing the battle, as we'll see, he will go to the tent of Hever Akeni and his family to seek refuge, because they're, they're B'nai Bris, they're part of the covenant, so I feel comfortable here. Now, that would have been impossible if the Kenites were living in, if he was living in the south with all of his brethren, there's no chance Sisera would ever end up in, his, in Yael's tent, as we'll see. But since he decided, for whatever reason, to move north, all of history changed, and we have this trans, uh, delicious piece of uh, Navi that we're learning tonight. Uh, just goes to show you that if we think they were ever involved in, like, uh, you know, minor decisions in our life, you never know how far-reaching the consequences will be. Uh, uh, we decided you know, maybe we'll move to New Jersey. I guess we'll go to only. I guess we'll, yeah. these little decisions that are based on just details, they affect all of history. From here and forward, all of history is affected. Who will you meet? Who will you bump into? Who will your family bump into? And, and how will that impact everything? It's, it's a tremendous thing. Just here we have like a little slice of Hashem's providence. That the decisions of individuals impact national and historical events. Okay, so forging forth, the verse number 11, we just read, is the parenthetical thing uh, of the of Cherokee. And now we have uh, verse 12. They told Sisera that Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sister gathered, Sisera gathers his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him from Haroshet Goim to Kishon Brook. So we understand here, this is not just Sisera and his nation. The King Yavin was a powerful one, and he was the gathering place for all nations. He had a lot of people on his side. Deborah says to Barak, and now they're going up against the Jews. In verse number 14, Deborah says to Barak, Arise, kum. Hashem has given Sisera into your hands. Hashem will go out before you, and he will win. If you recall, the last uh, battle that the Jews had was a very, a more or less of a natural one. You had, you know, the hidden, the hidden uh, knife, the hidden dagger in uh, Ehud's, you know, clothing. He stabbed Eglon and they went down and they had a big war with, the, with Moab. Here, it's going to be much less natural, far less natural. You're talking about 10,000 foot soldiers against a tremendous army multiple, mul of multiple nations with chariots and everything. Here you see that Devorah was able to lift the nation up to such a degree that they merited a much more miraculous intervention. So Devorah says to him, Hashem has given them into your hands. And uh, Barak descends from Har Tavor with 10,000 men behind him. Hashem confounded Sisera and all the chariots and the entire camp by the edge of the sword before Barak. What it, what it says Hashem confounded him, that means they, they suddenly became afraid. They hear noises. They hear people coming from different directions. The Jews just, you know, the Jews just market, marching, maybe anxiously, or who knows what they were thinking about. But in the meantime, in the enemy camps, they were going berserk. You know, such things are described in the Six-Day War um, and in, in other battles in Israel, how there were like these miraculous stories where the enemies just suddenly became overwhelmed and, and fled, even though they had much stronger numbers. Hashem was able to, to confound them. So that's what we're seeing happen here. Hashem is confounding our enemies because he's on our side. So before we do any fighting, the enemies are already, already jumping ship. Isn't, isn't that a parallel to uh, Jericho, where they marched around the city for, what, six days? Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. So here, they're, they're very good. Hashem also did the fighting over there. Over there, it was much more miraculous. They didn't have to die. The walls came tumbling down. But here also, they're just marching forward into battle. But before they even get battle, they get to battle, they're already confounded. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and that's important to note, because until now, it's been a downgrade, right? From Jericho, which was super miraculous, came the Battle of Ai, which had a little bit of divine assistance. We had the hail from the sky. And then you go down and down and down to a natural kind of battle. You have to devise a strategy where you sneak in and you stab the guy. Yeah. And now we're going up again. And that is thanks to Devorah. It's thanks to Devorah, she was able to uplift the nation to such an extent that they merited this intervention again. Okay. Um, 
So it says in 16, Barak chased after the chariots. Imagine, yeah? imagine a person running after a tank. Yeah, it's ridiculous, but he did that. He chased after the cha uh, chariots and after the camp until Harosh Goyim, they chased him right back into their city. And they all fell by the edge of the sword and not even one was left. Not even one was left. Sisera fled on his feet to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber Akeni. Because you recall, for there was a peace between Yavin and the house of Heber the Kenite. That's verse number 17. So Sisera is running on foot. He escapes, he flees from, uh, from the battle. He separates from his other soldiers. And he goes to the tent of Yael. Yael went out to him and said, I'm going to go to the Hebrew now. Sura Adoni, Sura Eli, Altira. She says to him, Come, come. She repeats it. Turn aside, my lord, turn aside, do not fear. So he turned aside to her tent, but the Haseo Basmichat, she covers him with a blanket. He's exhausted, right? He's been fighting a war, a losing battle. He's exhausted. He covers him with a blanket. Sura Adoni Sura, that expression, turn aside, turn aside, you know, we don't always get the full conversations that people had in the Bible. We don't really know all the words that Moshe, for example, said to Paro. The Torah captures the essence of what was said, and, and, and it writes that down. Maybe some of the words that are in the Torah is what they actually said. I'm sure they said other things as well. well so everything that is written by a prophet, we have to take it seriously, because the re they, they included this particular part of the conversation for a reason. So in this case, why does it repeat the word, turn aside? Surah Adoni, Surah. Turn aside, my Lord, turn aside. Just right, turn aside, she calls him, and she come, he comes in. He, the, the prophet is very efficient and doesn't waste a drop of ink. It goes without saying. So the commentaries learned from the fact that it's repeated here is she was convincing him. She was, she was a wise lady, Yael. She was a very smart lady, as we'll see further as well. And she did a little bit of, uh, 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 I don't know, whatever that is that women do to control men's men. <laughs> she, pull, she pulls him in. A little bit of manipulation, a little bit of convincing to get to draw him in. Surah Adoni, turn aside my lord, showing honor. Surah Eli, come to me. Here she's playing on his, on his uh, Yetzirah. She's seducing him, in a sense. Don't fear. I'm with you. I'm, I'm one of your neighbors. You can come to me. So he, so he says to her in verse number 19, uh, yeah, 19, yes, atmaim, give me some water because I'm thirsty. And she gives him milk. She gives him milk. So he asks for water. She gives him milk. The Targum Yonasan says that this was another testament to her wisdom here. She was trying to see how sharp he was at that moment. He, she sees that he's flustered. She sees that he's exhausted. But she wants to know what she could get away with over here. He asks for water. She says, oh, yeah, sure, let me go get it. She gives him a pouch of milk. Is he going to be, is, is his mind sharp enough to realize that she's switching it up? She, she's testing, she's testing his, uh, his current state. And he drinks it. So she sees that he's already in a weakened, in a vulnerable kind of state. But they say when she covers him again. Rashi says she gave him milk specifically uh, because it makes you very tired. I know there's like the proverbial glass of warm milk that like puts people to sleep. I, I don't know if she, it was warm in this case, but I do know that it was not the milk that we can buy in Giant. Uh, it's the milk that you can't buy anywhere because it's illegal. You know, that the real milk, you ever been to a farm with the layers of cream and fat and all that, all the good stuff in it, that's what she gave him. And milk, is, natural milk is very fatty. And that actually tires a person. That's very heavy, especially he just came back from, from battle. He's exhausted anyway. And on top of that, she gives him this, this heavy milk and he, he goes right to sleep. So we'll see in the song of Devora, which I don't think we'll get, we'll get to tonight, that she says the word surah like, come to me. She, she actually ends up having relations with him as well, which is very controversial. She was Jewish. And here she's having relations with a non-Jew, which is forbidden. But she, was, but she was doing it for good purposes. She was trying to put him to sleep and exhaust him so that she can kill him. <laughs> so is that allowed? Is it not allowed? That is a, um, a fascinating discussion that the Talmud uh, launches into in Masechus Horios and other places. 
I guess we'll leave that for next week. I don't want to. I don't want to cut that part short. Let's just read till the end of the story here. But I just wanted in, I inserted that to show you that there is more than meets the eye in this particular case. We have, we have to fill in the details that we'll learn in chapter five into this story. So she actually lays with him, and they have relations, and then he falls asleep. And he says to her beforehand. Um, Please stand at the entrance to the tent. And if anyone asks you, is anyone here? Just say no. <laughs> so tell them I'm not home. Yeah. Question is, if, if anybody's coming and checking on tents, if they're trying to find Sisera, they're going to rely on this lady who's just telling them that nobody home. Why don't you walk into the tent and check? He's putting her on guard and just tell them nobody's in your tent and they'll just keep walking. Uh, the reason apparently is if she says there's no man in the tent, it was inappropriate. Back then, people did not go into a woman's tent. It's clear here that actually, I forgot to stress, we're talking about her specific tent. Back then, women had their own tent. We find that by Avram and Sarah. He sets up her tent and then his tent. We find it by uh, Rachel and Leah. And there's the whole right, question of wh whose tent will Yaakov go to, right? The discussion between Rachel and Leah. Women had their own separate tent, and it was not the norm for a man to enter that tent. So she stands on the outside. She says, nobody's there. Then they, they know he wouldn't be there alone. Right? If there's no other man there, then obviously he wouldn't be there. Just to show you, like, the societal standards back then uh, were a little different than nowadays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he goes to sleep. <laughs> she takes the tent peg, which mm. was apparently very heavy. And she puts the hammer in her hand as well. And she comes to him secretly, quietly, while he's schluffing, while he's resting. And she inserts the tent peg into his temple. Ooh. And it goes all the way through. And it goes into the ground, through the head, into the ground. Uh, very graphic and uh, very extremely dead. <laughs> And he was already falling asleep, and he was exhausted, and then he died. Okay. Um, the Malvin here points out, it says she took the tent peg and the hammer, but it never says that she used the hammer. It just says she put the tent peg in his temple. So what she, she was holding the hammer, but she didn't use it. So evidently, he says, that the tent peg was so heavy that she didn't even get to hammering it in. It kind of just is like it weighed her down, and it, it went straight into, into Cicero's head. Maybe a sign of, of like a divine stamp of approval or something. You know, it, it's going. Things are going really smoothly. I didn't have to lift up a hammer. Uh, maybe it's a sign of divine approval. It's just interesting to know. It's the pasuk omits the fact that she used the hammer, which makes you wonder well, uh, what happened. Uh, and behold, Barak was chasing after Sisera. Barak is the Jewish general. You recall? Yeah, he's chasing after Sisera. I, I thought he went this way, and yeah, he was searching. But that say Eli Kratoya, El goes out to him. And she says, Come, I want to show you something. At the Isha Shara Tamiv Akesh, I want to show you the man you uh, you're looking for. By Avoile Barak comes to the tent of Yael, the Hina Sisra Nofel met, and he finds the dead uh Kanani general Sisra by a Ted Barak and with the tent peg in his temple. By Yachna Limbayamahu at Yavin Melechan, the Snape in Israel, and Hashem subjugated the king of Canaan before the Jews. This was this apparently, although they had a great defeat, it wasn't over until this point. Although the non-Jews had suffered a great defeat, like we saw, they were chased back into their city and all of them died. It's only after the death of Sisera that it describes the victory of the Jews. What you hear the question? Isn't that strange? I'll pose it as a question. This battle was long over. You have one army general left. He's just running by foot. It's over. Finished. The verse should have said that they defeated them at that point. The fact that Sisera died is just like, you know, icing on the cake. Why does it say first that Sisera died, this whole story with the El, and then tells us that the Jews won the war? Apparently, the message is that the war was not over as long as Sisera was alive. Sisera was such a talented and powerful general. That even though he suffered a tremendous defeat, that wouldn't that, that wasn't the end of it. He would just regather his, his, his troops and regather it, and he'd be right back at them. That's what a fierce warrior we're dealing with. And this is to magnify 
is the extent of the miracle that Hashem has done for the Jews. 10,000 men on foot. And they, they completely obliterated this most powerful army with this most powerful general, who even one man on foot, this general, could have, could have mustered enough strength to, to defeat the Jews. And, and nevertheless, he, he was defeated. So that is a tremendous victory for the Jews, which is going to lead to Devorah's song, uh, which I keep promising we'll do, but <laughs> I guess we'll wait another week. It's just, uh, you know, I don't want to skip over any details. So, so I hope you don't mind. We took it verse by verse here. And so the final verse in the chapter is, in chapter four is, Vatelech Yad B'nei Yisrael Haloch Bekasha. And the hand of the Jews strengthened Al Yavin Melch Kanan on the king of Kanan, Ad Asher Yichritu Et Yavin Melch until they completely cut him off. He was no longer there. So this was a tremendous and complete defeat uh, at, by the Jews. And that will be the transition into Devorah's song, God willing. So it should be a so, uh, Shabbos filled with song for us. Uh, we had Shabbos Shira last week. We should continue singing uh, as we see more miracles in our life and for our people. All right. Have a wonderful night, everybody. I, All right, I guess I'll, thank I you. have to go to prayer. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah, but thank you. I, I once um, looked up Kenite to see who they were, and it said they were a clan of Midian. And Midian is, of course, one of uh, Abraham's descendants, one of Abraham's sons. So, did just well, who with Keturah? Yes, with Keturah, right? So he would have. They would have had circumcision, I believe. Um, I'm sure Abraham circumcised all his sons by Keturah. Um, but anyway, did just the Kenites uh, convert to Judaism, or was it the whole tribe of Midian? How how did that work out? Uh, very nice. So it, here it was just the Kenites. It was just the Kenites. They were the descendants of Yisro. Chever is, right. is Yisro. Right. So the, he he converted, and all of his descendants were converts. But that that was it for Midian. Other than that, we have uh, not such warm rela relationships with Midian. You see, even after Yisro converted from Midian, the the Midianites attacked us at the end of the desert experience, right? With with Balak, and they joined together for, with Moab to attack us. So you see that it was just that that family, that particular family that had converted. Just the Kenite clan. Yeah, the Kenite clan, exactly. Yeah, the clan, yeah. I wonder how big they were. It sounds like they were a significant number because they had a portion of the section of Israel for them. So it sounds like they were yeah, at least a few, a few hundred, few thousand. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, any other questions out there? I have some extra time tonight if you, need, uh, if you wanted to ask. Okay. Then I bid you adieu. You have a wonderful Shabbos. Thanks for learning. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.